Hello, and thank you so much for listening. Today we are doing Torah portion Emor. It's Leviticus 21, 22, 23, and 24 commentary. And um, this whole Torah portion is about being set apart and holy. Um, we as priests in training are not to be unclean. It's a picture of being called to be more Kodesh, more set apart, more holy than other people. So we need to be more diligent than the rest of Israel. Israel is called out to be more set apart than the world. And the priests are called out to be more set apart than Israel. And the whole entire earth. They are the holiest, most Kodesh people on the planet. And um, and we are priests in training, so we need to be called out to be the most Kodesh, set apart, and loving of all the earth. We have been chosen for this priestly calling, and we cannot do it by ourselves. We can do it by the power of Yahuwah. And when we are obedient to the commandments and strictly follow them, and diligently learn them because you can't follow them unless you learn them. So it's so important to read the scriptures and study them intensely so that we don't break any of the commandments. And then when we don't break any, then Yah allows His Son to abide in us. And the rule of Kakadesh comes upon us. And... Um, we're able to be the most Kodesh on the planet. Once we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we have a seed inside of us, and uh, we have the Messiah abiding in us when we're obedient. And this is powerful. This is powerful. So we can be uh, the most Kodesh. We could be like priests. Um, before the um, Messiah, people were not able, not everybody was, uh, 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 you know, engulfed in the Holy Spirit. Not everyone was able to read the scriptures or study it online. Or, uh, you know, they, most people didn't have the scriptures. It was only read to them once a week, if that. So we have a higher calling to be more Kodesh because we have higher accessibility to scriptures and, and commentaries and research and all kinds of um, online Bibles that read to you. Bible Gateway, uh, it'll play it for you. So you can listen to it all the time. This this wasn't uh, available back in the um, over uh, 150 years ago, 200 years ago. So um, we don't have we don't have we have less excuse. To, uh, so we have to be more Kodesh. We ha there's not a lot of wars going on in America. So that's another reason. There's a it's a time of peace. There's not a lot of persecution, um, so this is another reason why should we, we should be going out and evangelizing, doing all the hard work right now, because there's going to come a time when people will be killed for evangelism. Right now, there, there's uh, you're not you're not going to be killed, uh, most likely. <laughs> so, um, so the. We have a higher calling. We we so this this uh, this whole priestly uh, police, the priestly section of Leviticus is all about uh, being unclean, and it's physically unclean mostly in the scriptures here, but it's a picture of of the spiritual. He wants us to be spiritually unclean, and there is a connection too, physically uncleanness and spiritual uncleanness. So we want to strive. And do everything we can to be physically unclean. And we do that. We're showing the Father that we also want to be spiritually unclean. Because we're being obedient. And then the Messiah can abide in us. And this is powerful. Because once again we can walk perfect as he is perfect. Be perfect as he is perfect. It says in scripture. It can be done. It can be done. It's not going to be... You're not going to be 100% perfect, but you're going to be uh, better than Israel. <clears throat> and uh, we should be better than Israel. And then Israel is going to be better than the world. And then the world's going to be better than pagans. So there's, there's, a, there's a process, right? 
Well, we want to be the elite of the elite as far as righteousness. So this is super important, this whole chapter. So let's kind of dig into it and try to um, try to discern what Yah is trying to tell us here. So 1 John 2, uh, 5 says, uh, Whoever keeps his commandments, his word, truly the love of Elohim is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. So we're commanded to walk just as he walked. He's not going to give us a command that we can't do. So this is uh, another uh, verse saying that, yes, we can be like the priests. I'm sure the priests weren't perfect, but they were better than Israel. And, and they were definitely better than the world. And they were definitely better than pagans. So, um he wants us to be clean, not just clean, but squeaky clean. This is super important. We got to be the 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 most clean. Okay, as it says, if we abide in Him, we cannot sin. So how do we abide in Him? John fifteen ten. So this is super important right here. If we abide in Him, we cannot sin. So we need to stay abiding in Him. John fifteen ten says, if you keep my commandments. You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So there we go again. We need to know the commandments in order to keep them all. And so it's super important to study all the time. And when you're studying, you're filling yourself with uh, the Holy Spirit. When you're praying, you're filling yourself with the Holy Spirit. When you're fasting and praying, that's filling yourself with the Holy Spirit. And uh, when you're meditating on his words and uh, doing good works and evangelizing and, and spreading the gospel, this is all filling you with the Holy Spirit so that you can abide in the Father and he abide in you. And then all of a sudden, you're, you can follow the commandments easily because you're just filled with the Holy Spirit. So I believe that you can attain, um, you can be perfect as Yah is perfect for, you know, but then, you know, we all run out. It's kind of like gas in a car. We, you know, we drive around and we, you know, if you're praying for people, that's going to draw out the Holy Spirit. Um, it just, it goes as you go out th throughout the whole day because we are fleshly still. But Yah is looking for the people that, who are working hard and trying to uh, attain these goals. He's looking for the people that are studying hard. I know this one... Uh, um, a righteous uh, gentleman who uh, he studies uh, the scriptures four hours a day. He goes evangelizes three hours a day, and he prays for two hours a day. And then uh, him and his wife. I mean, this is something to look up to. This is uh, you know uh, something to, to try to attain. He's uh, he's doing well. He's doing really well. Okay, so let's see Matthew five forty eight. Therefore, you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Okay, so it is a command, and um, it's it can be attained, and it's uh, on a daily basis. We want to strive day by day. We want to strive for that, and we're not always going to hit it, but we're definitely going to try to get closer. And every day, we need to do something more that better that we didn't do last last. Uh, last year. We want to get be getting better and better. It's like a step. It's like Jacob's ladder. We want to walk up this ladder, getting more righteous, more righteous, more righteous. And the more righteous we get, the closer we get to the Father. This is what the Father's looking for. He's looking for the people that forgive others, don't get, doesn't get them mad, doesn't have a temper, doesn't um, um doesn't have, you know, goes after the desires of the flesh, just separates himself from the world and um, becomes um, righteous. Super important. Okay, this Torah portion is about clean and unclean. Tahor means clean. And Tameh means unclean or ritually impure. And Jewish tradition states that if a priest does marry a harlot, he can no longer be a priest. Jewish tradition states that if a priest does marry a harlot, he can no longer be a priest. Or someone who's divorced, he can no longer be a priest. 
Um, and it says in Leviticus 21.4, it says, oddly enough, this law says that the priests are not allowed to go to their wife's funeral of their immediate family. So I find that uh, interesting. They can go to all their other family members, but not their wives. It would, they, for some reason, that's left out and uh, not sure why. I find that interesting. Ezekiel 44, there seems to be some discrepancies. The different rules for priests during the millennial kingdom. Uh, as one of the sons of Zedekiah are allowed to be priests who are sons of Aaron and, and Levites. Only the sons of Zedekiah are allowed to be priests who are sons of Aaron. And um, also high, the high priest can't marry a widow. They must be, uh, there must be a sin offering after exposure to a dead body, which is not in this Torah portion uh, for the sons of Aaron. There is no... Uh, so it's a little bit different. As, so it's a, during the Millennial Kingdom, they're going to have priestly sacrifices. And uh, the sons of Zedekiah are the only ones allowed to be priests at this time. And uh, I find that um, interesting. So the rules are a little bit different. So, you know, as things go along, rules are changed, it seems like. There are slight changes. Um, just like in the New Testament, um, it says that uh, women should have their head covers. Uh, and also, we're baptized in the name of Yahushua. So there's new commands um, as we go along. Okay, also in Ezekiel 44, 18, it says the priests were to wear linen turbans on their heads and linen undergarments around their waists. They, mu they must not wear anything that makes them perspire. So this is interesting. Why could they not sweat in the tabernacle? So this is really interesting uh, because sweat signifies man's efforts. This is what I believe. Um... This is this is my opinion on this why people can't sweat in the it signifies man's efforts the first time sweat is mentioned in um, is in is in the Bible is in Genesis three nineteen and uh, it says Adam fell when Adam fell Yah said cursed is the ground. For the sake and toil you shall eat of it in the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the herb of the field, and by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Sweat is a result of the sin and is part of the curse. Because of it, the ground will not yield its fruit without man's effort and sweat. Okay, so because man's efforts produce sweat... And the priests were anointed by Yah and were not working just on their own efforts, but working with the Ruach HaKadosh powerfully in them. Uh, they were anointed for this special service uh, to be uh, leaders of morality and goodness. So they had to be pillars of the community. and they uh, So they had to be extremely diligent and to, to try to stay extremely clean. They were not doing this on their own power, but by Yah, because of their obedience. You see how this is all tied in? It's kind of tying in with being obedient, and then the Ruach can come in. And, and we are, in 1 Peter 2, 9, we are a holy priesthood, a treasured possession. We are a um, holy nation, a royal nation. And so we are to be like this. We're, we are to be extremely obedient to those commandments and try to follow all the rules that we can. Okay, goodness. Okay, we're, we're, they, these priests were supposed to be leaders in morality and goodness. They were not on their doing it on their own power, but the power of Yah and the Holy Spirit. So, so they they were not to sweat, as this would show everyone that the priests did not walk holy by their own means, but only through Yah's anointing of their position. And this is the same today. We cannot become super holy without being obedient first. The Ruach, then the Ruach can abide in us. 
and easily help us to walk out the commandments with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. And once we understand that it is not by our own power that we have this, uh, that we become righteous, then this is being humble as well and knowing that Yah is doing it. And, and uh, so we need to give glory where glory is due. So uh, anybody, anything that you do well, uh, if you're really good at your work and you make good money and you're just really efficient, and thank Yah for that. Don't thank yourself because you, you, you wouldn't be able to do it unless He made your mind, right? So this is being humble. Humble is giving credit to Yah for your abilities, talents, gifts, and not taking any credit yourself because you are just a vessel. And he's working through you for a purpose. And he wants you to stay humble and not take any credit for that. So uh, this is why they could not sweat. They were not doing it on their own power. They were doing it by the Ruach HaKadosh. And the priests knew this and understood this humbleness. And this is another part of having the Messiah abide in you. Because when the pride's in you, then the Holy Spirit can't come. The, the Messiah can't abide in you. So you need to just thank Yah for uh, everything that he does for you. And then it opens up the room for you to be a clean vessel and uh, have the Messiah abide in you. So thank Yah for everything he does. He is awesome. Praise Yah for all his um, gifts and blessings that he gives us. In Leviticus 10.10, 10, Yah is telling the priests after the death of Nadab and Abihu that they are not to mix the common with the profane. So uh, that you cannot, can you, so that you can distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. Yah is commanding us not to take what is kodesh and mix it with the common. The Sabbath is holy day and blessed and kodesh, as Yah set it up in Genesis, in Genesis two. So uh, we cannot make this day holy, or, or we cannot desecrate this day. This is a very bad sin, and. Um, and this is is uh, defiling that day. So whatever Yah sets up is holy in Kodesh, and we need to honor that. That's super super important. And most most people unknowingly are keeping Sunday um, and defiling the Sabbath, shopping, going out, movies. You know, not keeping it holy. So this is super important. All right. All right. Remember that it is not a sin to be unclean. So this is important. A lot of people say, well, you know, is it a sin to be unclean? No, it's not a sin to be unclean. However, it is a sin to go into the tabernacle or the temple unclean. Or if you eat of any offerings um, from the tabernacle or the temple, the sacrifices, and you're in an unclean state, you could die for being unclean near the tabernacle, and you could be cut off for eating uh, an offering in an unclean state, as Scripture says. Also, if you neglect to do the bathing rituals and clean, cleansing of your clothes, this would be a sin unto you as well. Um, also, it is a sin to touch the carcass of an unclean animal, so a dead pig... It's a carcass, not not a uh, pigskin football. I mean, we're talking about a carcass, a dead, rotting animal, because there's you know there's reasons for it. You don't want to touch anything that's dead. We all know that there's bacteria, bugs, fungus, all kinds of disgusting things. Things, there's all kinds of diseases you can get from that. So we're not to touch the carcass of an unclean animal, nor eat it. Uh, Leviticus eleven eighteen. So um, some also say that we can touch. Not touch the carcass of a dead bug. So um, this one is um, we don't see it in scripture, but we do see don't touch the uh, unclean animal. Don't touch the carcass of an unclean animal. We don't. It doesn't say unclean bug, but we still don't want to touch dead bugs, right? Um, so I would just stay away from it. It's this one is debatable. But it's something to think about because, um, again, you have decomposition and fungus and all kinds of weird stuff going on. 
So I would say it might not be a sin to touch a dead bug, but I would stay clear away from it. Wear gloves or something. Okay, uh, Leviticus 15.31. You must keep the Israelites separate from things that make them unclean, so they will not die in their uncleanness for defiling my dwelling place, which is among them. See, so there's the command not to be unclean and go near the temple. So there's... That's for Israel, not just the priest. Okay, Leviticus 7.20. But if anyone who is unclean eats meat from the peace offering, and the peace offering was given to Israel and to the priest, that belongs to Yahuwah, the person must be cut off from Israel. So if anyone touches anything unclean, dead bug, with human uncleanness, an unclean animal or an unclean detestable thing, then eats any of the meat of the peace offering, that belongs to Yah, that person will be cut off from his people, which is very serious. Uh, being cut off is not a good thing. I don't know how long it is, but uh, Jewish tradition says that it's uh, potentially, um, and you have a shorter lifespan, uh, you're, you might be cut off from the kingdom, you're definitely cut out of the camp, put outside the camp, and also um, possibly uh, no children. Or less children. So it's being cut off is a big big deal as far as Jewish tradition goes. They use Psalms 109 for that. May his posterity be uh, cut off. Which is um, where they get that verse. The, the idea behind it. So uh, either way we don't want to be cut off. And hopefully it's just a temporary thing until they repent. But if you did it on accident... That's a whole other story. They're, I think they're looking at people that doing it, doing it on with a high hand. Leviticus eleven twenty four, regarding dead unclean bugs, you will make yourself unclean by these. Whoever touches the, their carcass will be unclean till evening. Whoever picks up one of the carcasses must wash their clothes, and they will be unclean till evening. So it looks like you do not have to bathe after touching the carcass of an unclean animal. You just have to wash your clothes. Okay, so if you step on a bug barefoot accidentally, then you would have to bathe and wash your clothes because the unclean bug was alive, then you killed it, then you have to do both. Wash your clothes because it is a dead carcass and bathe your skin because you touched an unclean bug. So this is the rule, and then you'll be clean at evening. And you are possibly not allowed to kill a bug with your bare hands on purpose per this command uh, to not touch any unclean carcass of a bug. Possibly, this is uh, a theory, because we're not supposed to touch a carcass of an unclean animal. Why bother touching an unclean uh, carcass of a bug? So it's just something we need to work on and try to um, come up with a plan not to do this. Okay, he will also be unclean if he touches something defiled by a corpse or if, by anyone who has an omission of semen or if he touches any crawling thing, um, any crawling thing that makes him unclean or any person who makes him unclean. Whatever the uncleanness may be, the one who touches any such thing will be unclean till evening. He must not eat any of the sacred offerings unless he's bathed himself with water. When the sun goes down, he will be clean, and after that he may eat of the sacrificed offerings, for they are his food. Okay, whoever touches any creepy thing whereby he may he be made unclean, or a man of whom he may take uncleanness, whatever uncleanness he hath, that soul which hath touched any such shall be unclean until evening and shall not eat of the holy things unless he washes his flesh with water. So he's not to eat of it. So you, you just so you just have to bathe if you touch a bug that's alive and then you will be clean at evening. However, if you touch a dead bug, then you have to wash your clothes and it will you will be clean at evening. If you step on a live bug with your bare foot and kill it, you have to do both, bathe and wash your clothes, and you'll be clean. 
So I just, I mean, I just want to get that straightened out because um, we, we we want to try and hard, hard to be clean, and and when we're when we're obedient to these little laws, right? Then Yah sees that that our heart is striving to be obedient to Him, even in the littlest matters. And there's something spiritual, I believe, to this being clean and being unclean state physically. I think there's a spiritual significance that we don't understand. And so I think it's important to try to strive to follow these rules, even though they may seem uh, minor. But it says in Scripture, if you uh, break any of the least of commandments, you have broken the greatest. So we want to try to learn these commandments and try to follow them the best we can and not to break these. And Yah loves that when we do that. He loves obedient people. And the Messiah will abide in us. Praise Yah. Okay, verse 2. If anyone goes to a funeral or steps on a grave of a dead body, he will be defiled or unclean. Seven days and must do the red heifer sacrifice and then cleanse himself with the ashes of water and bathe on the third day and the seventh day. So the priests, this would, this would make them, so they could not go into the tabernacle seven days. So this was very important. If they were on duty, uh, they, uh, they could they wouldn't be able to do service for seven days. That's huge. But remember, the red heifer is a picture and a foreshadow of Yeshua. And both were sacrificed outside the camp. Both involved hyssop and cedar wood. Um, theoretically, cedar wood. We're, we're assuming that his uh, stake that he was nailed to was cedar wood. Um, so there's two things going on here. Um, you don't... Um, the pre, as a priest, um, you, you, if you're on duty, you, do, you don't want to go to a funeral unless you're to immediate family. If you're a high priest, you can't go at all um, when you're on duty because you've got to stay um, on on. You got to stay in your position. Now they say that this law wasn't in effect if they were off duty and they weren't doing um, sacrifices, you know, because they would rotate. They would rotate. So um, that's the theory. It makes sense to me, but I don't know. I would try to stick to the commandments as a priest as best you can. But Okay, so uh, if this priest was defiled, he went to a funeral or accidentally stepped on a grave, then he'd have bathed on the third day and on the seventh day, and then he'd have to do the a red... He'd have to use the... Cleanse himself with the ashes of the red heifer in the water. Uh, but Yeshua is... Um, our red heifer, and I'll try to tie that in here. Uh, it says right here, Numbers 9, if it states that you have been to a funeral and been in the same room as the body or stepped on a grave, that you are not able to do this and eat the sacrifice, uh, Passover lamb. Unless you do the red heifer cleansing. Right now, we do not have the red heifer ashes. However, Yeshua is a picture of the red heifer as he was clothed in a red scarlet robe. He was killed outside the camp like the red heifer. He wasn't in the tabernacle. And just like the red heifer, he would he was fed water and vinegar with hyssop. And it is my belief that Yahusha was nailed to a cedar wood Steak, as we see the red heifer, is used using all these items in uh, Numbers 19, verse 18. I'm just going to read it to you. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. So, uh, Yeshua, a lot of people believe that, um, this is a theory, a lot of people think, believe that Yeshua is our red heifer sacrifice. So now we can be, if we go to a funeral... We bathe on the third day and the seventh day, and we and we pray and we thank you, Husha, for being our red heifer sacrifice and cleanses us. Then we can be clean. Um, some people say you cannot do the Passover unless uh, if you've ever been to a funeral or stepped on a grave. But I believe that that this um, red heifer is a symbol of Yeshua 
and we are clean through him. It's just a theory I have, and I really like it, so I'm sticking to it. Okay. Priests um, were not allowed to go to funerals unless it was their immediate family, except for their wife. Their wife was not allowed. The high priests weren't allowed to go to any funeral at all. Um, I believe the reason is the high priest knows that this life is not the only life. We are not to mourn for the dead, but be happy that they were even alive and created because they're going to get eternal life, right? And they're going to get to live forever. And so this is just a temporary situation. Um, and so the priest know, the high priest knows this and understands this concept. And since they were uh, righteous, they will live forever in the eternal kingdom. And the high priest was well aware of this, and also because it was not, it was not to be around those things that are dead and unclean, as he was a representative of Yah, who is all about life and being clean and set apart, not death and uncleanness. So, Yah is all about life. So, um, yeah. The high priest cannot go to any funerals. And this is why uh, when Nadab and Abihu were killed, Aaron was not allowed to mourn or take off his jacket or, uh, or take off his priestly garments or his, unwrap his, his um, turban. He's supposed to stay in that position um, because um, he's in a high position role. He's a representative of Yah. It's like the President of the United States. Do you see the President of the United States ever without a suit? No. Very rarely do you see that. I mean, especially on uh, official uh, stuff. He's always in a suit. That's the position. You have to wear a suit. It's part of the deal. And you got to stay in that suit. And you're not allowed, uh, you know, you've got um, you've got to be strong during tough times. You've got to be a picture, a picture of a righteous pillar who can stand uh, hardship and not be shaken because he knows the greater plan that Yah has. Okay, now some people say, now I'm going to get, I'm going to go back a little bit here. Some people say there's a connection with unclean animals and demon possession. As we, as we know that demons can dwell in unclean sinful people, and we know that demons can dwell in unclean animals, because Yeshua cast demons into pigs, so if you touch one of these unclean animals that are dead, can a demon transfer to you? And this is the big, the big um, thing that people are talking about right now, is... Can demons be transferred? Is this there's something spiritual going on that we don't know about? And um, I mean, it's possible. It's possible. We can't say for sure. But if Yahuwah says don't touch something, well, I would definitely uh, not touch it. It's super important. Okay, so let me just paste this in here. Okay. Okay, so priests weren't allowed to go to funerals except their immediate family. Oddly enough, the priests today actually officiate funerals, <laughs> which was forbidden except for the immediate family. And also below, um, so this is kind of weird, right? Priests don't do funerals. Um, 
but they weren't allowed to in scriptural times. I guess they would have maybe a Levite uh, do it. I'm not really sure. Uh, but yeah, today all the priests uh, do it now. And um, also, in most Catholic church and cathedrals, I'm sorry, in most Catholic cathedrals, a dead priest's bones um, are put under the cathedral. So anytime you go to a Catholic cathedral, you are unclean and need to, need to do the bathing ritual on the third and seventh day and uh, the red heifer sacrifice, uh, which is Yeshua. So uh, it's something to remember uh, when you go to a Catholic church that there are dead bones in that building. And it's something to be aware of. We're not really sure why they do it. Um, but I don't think it's... Uh, I don't think it should be done. That's just my opinion. Okay, so let's see here. Okay. Having a little computer problem here, I apologize. Okay, uh, Numbers 1911. Whoever touches any dead body will be unclean for seven days. He must purify himself with water on the third day and the seventh day, then he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day and the seventh day, he will not be clean. The person must be cut off from Israel. He remains unclean because the water of pur purification has not been sprinkled on him as his uncleanness is still in him, on him. So this red heifer sacrifice... Um, again, needs to be done for the people, not just the priests. Um, but we don't have a red heifer, but Yeshua is a picture, uh, the red heifer is a picture of Yeshua being the, so um, we, I believe, but I think it's good still to practice this third day and seventh day cleansing. We don't know what the spiritual ramifications of this are, so it's super important. All right, here are some of the things that can make you defiled from a dead body. Um, okay, Numbers, four, Numbers 19, 14. This is the law. When a man dieth in a tent, all that come into the tent are, and that is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. Numbers 19, 15. And every open vessel which has no covering bound upon it is unclean. Um, again, we have decomposing bodies and weird stuff floating around. So don't drink water instead <laughs> with a dead body. Uh, 1916, and whoever touches one that is slain with a sword in the open field or a dead body of a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. Again, uh, the bone, uh, yeah, that's a dead body. So uh, if you have a bone in your tent or your house, then your house is unclean. I'm sorry. Uh, people keep the ashes of people and that your house is unclean. Um, you might want to keep it somewhere else. I don't know. Um, according to scripture, all the people were um, all the people were buried uh, in the, within the same day. They were buried as well. Okay, according to scripture, it's not a command. It's just what we see in scripture as being done. Well, no, actually, I think it is a command. I have to go back and study that one out. But I think they have to bury it the same day. Okay, Numbers nineteen seventeen. For the unclean person, put some ashes from the burnt purification offering into a jar and pour fresh water over them. Then a man who is ceremonially clean is to take some hyssop, dip it in the water, and sprinkle it in the tent of all the furnishings of the people who were there. He must also sprinkle anyone who has touched a human bone or a grave or anyone who has been killed or in anyone who has died of natural death. The man who is clean is to sprinkle those who are unclean. On the third day and the seventh day, and the seventh day, he is to purify them. 
Those who are being cleansed must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and that evening they will be clean. But those who are unclean do not purify themselves. They must be cut off from the community because they have defiled the sanctuary of Yahuwah. The water of the cleansing has not been sprinkled on them. They are unclean. This is a lasting ordinance. Here we go. This is a lasting ordinance for them. This is uh, forever. So this is super important that we follow this command. A lot of people don't know this, but um, again, I would on the seventh day ask to be purified from the from the uh, ashes and water and blood of the red heifer, which is pointing to Yeshua. Ask the Father to cleanse you and purify you. Um, and so you'll be clean. And, we, and it looks like you're supposed to clean your clothes and your uh, and bathe. So this is important too. We want to try to be obedient as possible. Okay, verse 5. This is a really good one. Should we have a beard? Is it a command to have a beard? This one is very controversial. <laughs> and there's a lot of debate on it. But I'm going to sum it up real easy and simply for you in a brief. Um, I don't want to go into all the history. But I'll just read uh, the high points and uh, make it real quick for you. Okay, so. I do not necessarily believe it is a sin to shave. As the command is not to shave the corners. And that word literally means corners. Just like the farmers is not to... Um, to not to harvest the corners of the field. So um, he's supposed to lead. It's the same word. So uh, it literally means corners. So there's something going on with the corners that the pagans would do. It would shave just the corners. So if you shave all the beard, then you would not be breaking this command, I believe. Just like it says not to shave circles or cuts on the sides of your beard in your hair, like the pagans. But it seems okay to shave your head. He the Head, as we see that those in mourning, like Job, shaved his head, and Job was a righteous man. Also, lepers and those ending a Nazarite vow were allowed to shave their heads and beards. So I believe it might be okay to be clean shaven as long as you don't do not just shave the sides only, as some people uh, can grow beards and um, also uh, some people can't grow beards. And this is another one. So would it be a sin unto him because he can't grow a beard? No, of course not. He would be pure. Uh, and so Yah didn't make this a command. It's not a command to have a beard. However, it was a pagan custom of shaving beards and cutting themselves. And um, a lot of pagans throughout history were clean shaven. Isaiah 15, 2, Dabon goes up to the temple to its high places to weep. Moab wails over Nebo. In Mediba, every head is shaved and every beard cut off. See, the pagans would shave their beard when they mourned, and the and the Israelites would only shave their head and keep their beard, as Job did. And let's see, Deuteronomy twelve thirty says, "Do not worship Yah in the ways of the pagans." So this is important. The pagans um, would. Um, most, a lot of pagans were clean shaven. Jeremiah 10, learn not the way of the pagans. Uh, sin is breaking the law and there is no command to have a beard. And there is no command to not shave all of your beard. But there is a command to not to do as the pagans do and worship Yah that way. So it is my conclusion that many people... Are bald naturally or can't grow a beard and I believe this is fine with Yah. Also if you are a priest you're commanded to trim your head and um, beard if you are commanded not to but and you are commanded not to shave your head but it does not say anything about a beard shaving your beard for a priest. So uh, priests are not to shave their head. I believe we should keep the beard and hair on the head unless you are doing cleansing mourning or ending a Nazarite vow. Although I do not see a command to not shave all the beard, just the corners, and you are commanded to shave the beard after a Nazarite vow. So it might be okay not to have a beard, but Yah 
put beards there for a reason. In Yeshua, we are to emulate, walk as he walk. We are to emulate Messiah as Paul, emulate me as I emulate uh, Messiah as Paul says. So we're supposed to copy what um, Messiah Yeshua did. So I'm 95% sure that we should have a beard, though it might not be a sin to shave the beard, but it does not look good scripturally speaking. Um, all the righteous men had beards in scripture, and the Romans, the Egyptians, they were clean shaven. Uh, so this, it's it's a tough it's a tough call, but I'm, I'm going to sum it up right here. Okay, here we go. Make it real simple. I believe it may not be a sin to be clean shaven. And in fact, it is common for Israelites to shave their beard when mourning. Uh, not beard, but uh, shave their head during mourning. And the Israelites were uh, actually commanded to shave their heads after a cleansing of leprosy or ending a Nazarite vow. But based on all the scriptures showing only the pagan people having been clean shaven, like the Egyptians and the Romans... There is a command not to do as the pagans do and worship him that way. And every single one of the righteous men in scripture all had beards. Not one of them did not have a beard. I, I don't see it anywhere in scripture. So these are the ones we're supposed to emulate. We're not we're not we're supposed to be set apart, not of the world. The world is clean shaven and all the righteous men in scripture had beards. So this is and Yeshua, who we're supposed to emulate, were commanded to emulate and copy, had a beard, as we see in Isaiah 56. I offered my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who tore out my beard. I did not hide my face from the scorn and spittle. So uh, it's a prophecy of Messiah getting beaten up and they, they pulled his beard. So he had a beard. So, you know, this is a decision that you get to make personally. Um, you know, it... Let me just finish real quick here. And the final reason we should have beards is Paul says to imitate me as I imitate Messiah. So my conclusion is that we should all have the beard and follow in the footsteps of the Kodesh righteous ancestors and not follow the Egyptians and Romans customs as we are to be set apart and different and follow the righteous people in scripture. All the righteous people had beards. All the pagans and Egyptians mostly had clean shaven now is it a sin to be clean shaven for a short time no it's not but we want y'all put it there for a reason and we should try to um, do as what our forefathers did and to be set apart and so uh, if you want to have it short shaven you can buy, buy a razor and put a one on it and you know have it clean shaven but at least you have a beard right so uh, that's my conclusion is it's Probably not a sin, but it is very wise, in my opinion, to have a beard. Um, just to be like our forefathers, our righteous forefathers. Okay, verse 10. That's enough of the beard thing. I hope uh, nobody gets mad about that. But uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a good conclusion uh, to the problem. I, I think it's a good idea to... To go ahead and have the beard. Have the beard. You can have as short as you want. As long as you have a beard. But it's not a sin to be clean shaven. But let's follow our righteous ancestors and our Messiah as commanded. Okay. Verse 10. Do not unbind their heads and c cover and tear their garments as a sign of mourning. It says not to unbind their heads and cover and tear their garments as a sign of mourning was not allowed. As many mourners would do this for the dead. Okay, so as it lines up with the verse about mourners who would tear their garment, so as a priest is not allowed to do this. So priests were not allowed to unbind their heads or tear their garments ever. And even though they were upset in mourning, they need to be strong and not walk away from their positions for any reasons as they are pillars of the community. Also by tearing the Kodesh garments would be a disrespecting the position. During Yahusha's time, the high priests tore their garments 
and broke this command. And some say they were prophetically mourning the death of Yeshua, their own brother. From They were all from Judah, and they were brothers, and they were mourning before you. Um, they killed. So they also, they broke this command, and they prophetically mourned the death of Yeshua. Okay. And, um... When Nadab and Abihu died, um, uh, Aaron was commanded not to unbind his uh, head covering. And he needed to be strong. And uh, I think I went over this in last week's Torah portion, why I believe Nadab and Abihu were struck. And it had to do with um, Aaron participating in the golden calf, not only participating, but officiating the golden calf idol worship. And that's bringing profane fire. So uh, his sons were punished for his sins. So he was not allowed to mourn and unbind his turban. It's a command. So it's super important to remember that. And um, there's a reason behind it. He's in a high, high position. Okay, once uh, there were, uh, there's a story about President Reagan. Once he was in the Oval Office during a hot summer when the AC went out. And the staff could see that he was sweating and said, Why don't you just loosen your tie, take your tie off and your jacket. And um, so you'll be a lot more cooler. And they were bringing fans in and stuff. And he says, um, and Ronald Reagan says, I can't. I'm in the position of the United States presidency. I cannot dishonor this position. So I like that. I, I thought that was really cool. And it's a picture of the same thing with Aaron or the high priest. You cannot break down under pressure, under extreme situations. You've got to stay in control. You've got to be calm. You've got to be um, a, a pillar of strength for the people, right? People are freaking out and you got to calm them down. And you can't show inside that you're freaking out. You got to keep your composure, keep your suit on and um maintain a uh a pillar of strength, be be a pillar of strength for the people. So this is this is the reason I believe. Uh, just a theory on that. That's my theory. Um okay. Um, verse 11, the priests, this is uh, chapter 21, Leviticus 21, ch verse 11, the high priest could not go to any funeral ever, although the regular priest could go to a funeral of the immediate family. Okay, we already discussed this. <laughs> Yeah, so the high priest uh, could not leave his position during a funeral. Even if it was his parents, it was kind of sad, but that's, yeah, mix the rules, and so there we have it. Okay, uh, chapter 22. If, if, any, if any priest who is unclean comes near a Kodesh animal offering, he is cut off. All sacrifices were set apart in Kodesh, especially the blood. The blood would cleanse and sanctify the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, and the priests. So uh, if any unclean priest came near a super Kodesh uh, animal sacrifice, that was not a good thing. They would be cut off from Israel. So this is a huge thing. I mean, when you're a priest, you got to remember all this stuff. So again, uh, we as priests have to be diligent to follow all the laws and not make any mistakes. This means to be uh, try to be unclean as much as possible. Super important. Um, spiritually and physically. Uh, and there's not, I think there's some spiritual aspects of being clean. Okay, verse 5 of chapter 22. If you touch a bug, you are unclean until evening. You just have to wait until sundown to be clean. No washing, apparently. Okay, we already went through that. Yeah. 
یعنی که Okay, verse 17 says, Any foreigner or non-Israelite was allowed to give a free will peace offering. So, you see right here that foreigners were grafted into Israel. So, it's not a bloodline, even in the past. So, that's verse 17, Leviticus 22. Just write that down and show any anybody that, uh, you know, especially... Jewish people believe that, who we love very much. We love our Jewish brother. Um, they're our older brother, so we have to give them the honor of being the older brother. And they've kept the Sabbath this whole time. I mean, they, there's a, they're, they're in covenant with the Father. So there's a big... We are, It's our job to uh, slowly show them that Messiah, Yeshua, is the Messiah. So that's our job. Uh, it's a Kadori, even. He's an Orthodox Jew, very righteous, lived 107 years old, I believe. And he wrote down the name of Messiah on a card, and he said to open it a year after his death, and it said, Yeshua. And there's a YouTube video you can show them. Also talk to them about the uh, second exodus and show them all the Bible verses about the second exodus. They'll love that. And how many of your scriptures has a has a booklet with all the uh, showing Yeshua in, in prophecy on the Old Testament. And you can just go through that and show them that. And um, that's our job. We need to start working on that. That's that's one of the things we need to work on. Okay, Leviticus 23. That was a fast chapter 22. <laughs> okay, um, verse 2. Uh, the word feast or appointed time is Moed, which is an uh, official royal date to be with Yah. If you're going to meet the Queen of England and the President of the United States, you would be on their best behavior. You would be dressed up in your finest clothes uh, to meet this uh, royal family. And our creator of the universe, we should be doing the same thing for this meeting, getting our best clothes, be excited to be meeting the Father, because that's what it is. It's a date with him. And so every week we get to meet with him. What an honor. And, uh, okay. Every week we meet with him. Every month on Rosh Kodesh, the new moon. Every six months on the high days, Passover and Sukkot. In Shavuot in the middle. And we get a vacation. We get a 10-day vacation every six months. The Yah gives us to be and dwell with him. And every seven years on the Shemitah, we get a year we're not supposed to work. And spend time with him and rejoicing with him. And Yah will provide all the food and you don't have to worry about anything. And on the 50th year, so it'll be the 49th and 50th year, you get two-year vacation. You don't have to work as a celebration. And um, next week's Torah portion will go a little bit deeper into this. Uh, it's a really good one. It's called Bahar. And um, I'll be putting that up next week. But um, I have a show you the difference between between the Shemitah and the Bahar. And I think that you'll uh, get it. it. It's a good it's a good tour portion. I really liked it. It was very enjoyable. And uh, I'll go into that a little bit more. But uh, yeah, Yah wants us to rest every seven years and not work. How cool is that? And every 49th and 50th year, we get two years of no work when you just... We just, uh, Yah provides all the food and, and, and we get to dwell with Him and study and we're commanded to read the whole Torah uh, during the Shemitah year. And so it's a day of dedicate. it's a year of dedicating yourself to Yah and it's like going back into the Garden of Eden. And Yah provides all the food and all we're doing is worshiping Him and loving Him and we're part of His royal family and we're spreading the gospel and, and doing good works and... And this is this is what God wants, and this is the way He originally planned it. But but ever since the fall, then when we have to go to work uh, for six days and for six years, and so we fell out of that, and now we don't get. It's hard to uh, worship. I try to pray while I'm working. It's and 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 it's hard to you know deal with customers and 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 pray and try to keep it holy and. You know, you, so it's a battle, and that's why we're called Israel, which means struggle. It's a struggle for us. We have to sweat to earn money to pay rent, and so um, we um, we want to make it back to the garden, which is the whole plan. And uh, uh, the seventh year and the the 
fiftieth year. This is all a picture of getting back back to the garden. And every seven days, it's being back in the garden, right? We don't have to cook. We don't have to cook. All the food's already prepared. We just get to eat of it, right? And that's how Adam and Eve were. They would just eat it off the tree, and and eat food, and they would just worship Yah and study His Word and pray and sing songs to Yah. I mean, this is <laughs> this is awesome. That's all we want to do every day. It would be great, but we have to work. So um, that's where we are right now. But we can try to keep every day kind of like a Sabbath, and um, I think Yah likes that. So uh, Yah gives us rest, which is cool. He gives us rest every seventh year. And that's why people get burnt out, because they're, they're not taking the land rest, and they're not giving the land a rest as well. Uh, because they're working 20 years straight and no, you know, vacations every six months and uh, not every month We're on the new moons and every seven days. Some people work seven days a week, which is, they make a lot of money, but they're uh, mentally, they're going to, they're going to, something's going to break down. Okay. Verse 31, chapter 23. Um, it says, you're commanded to start your fast at least 10 minutes prior to sundown. This is a law forever. And this is uh, for um, the uh, Yom Kippur. <clears throat> and so, um, yeah. So it's uh, this also... Um, Okay, so yeah, this um, this also proves that the sundown is the beginning of the day as well in this verse. So, okay. So this kind of uh, fixes that problem. Okay, chapter 24. That was a fast, <laughs> that was a fast chapter. <laughs> Trying to just do the highlights so I don't bore people. Okay, so the Israelites get to help. Uh, with the holy temple to bring pure oil to the temple what an honor to be able to contribute to the kodesh temple it's a picture of us to continually fill ourselves with the ruach hakodesh presenting it to yah by being pure and holy and kind and then yah will be pleased with us uh, with our gifts of praise so you see the israelites the, the the not the Levites, not the priests, but the Israelites were allowed to bring holy, pure oil, olive oil, to the temple to be burned in the uh, menorah. So this is cool. The the people were allowed to be a part of this, and I don't know. They were probably fighting over who would get to be a part of it, but they probably rotated every every week or whatever, every day. And so, what an honor! And this is us. We should be feeling ourselves. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a physical representation of, of the spiritual. We are supposed to be feeling ourselves with the Holy Spirit and presenting ourselves to the tabernacle and to Yah is is full of pure holy oil, a pure holy spirit, and uh, we need to be filling ourselves with the oil. It's like the ten virgins. The ten virgins, um, ten of them had oil. And uh, the, I mean, five of them had oil. And um, five of them didn't. And so we need to be those Israelites with the oil, bringing it to the temple. So we'll be, we will be accepted into the kingdom because we have been filling ourselves with oil, praying, fasting, studying, meditating on the word, studying the word. And... Um, and doing good works and uh, keeping the fruits of the spirit and not getting angry, not getting uh, fleshly, and so um, we need to be constantly working on that daily. So we'll, we'll we'll be acceptable and be one of the five virgins. Okay, the four, verse four: the fire is never to go out, and fire represents Yah's Holy Spirit. So as long as we do our part and fill ourselves with the oil, the Holy Spirit, by praying, fasting, studying the word, we can present ourselves as pure, holy oil to, to, to Yah <clears throat> and be filled with the Holy Spirit and serving Him daily in His very presence. Yeah. And His presence will never leave us because of this. Verse 5. Whenever... Uh, 
they would gather wheat, they would gather the best and finest flour. Um, so they would gather this wheat. Uh, I'm just going to read verse 5 because. Okay, it says, In the first month of the 14th day of the month, between the evenings, the Pesach is. Anyway, I'll just read. Uh, anyway, so let's just get to the verse. Let's see. Okay, I'm not sh sure. Where. Oh, this is 24, chapter 24. Sorry. Five, and you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it, uh, two tenth parts in each cake. Okay, so this fine flour, uh, Jewish tradition uh, says that when um, they would gather the wheat, um, they would gather the best and finest flour that would be left over on after every grinding. There was a fluffy or lighter flour, and it was very minimal. It was so it was just a little bit left over after being after they grinded it. And it was the lightest and tastiest of the wheat. The Levites would use this for the table of the showbread. It was the best and most expensive of the wheat, and the uh, chefs that would make this, would not eat of this wheat. They would only give it to the priests as a symbol of honor and integrity. Even though they were allowed to eat of it, they never ate of it because in that, went, uh, that went for centuries. Even after the Messiah, they, this is the same thing with the showbread. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. Up until, uh, yeah, after the Messiah. Uh, but they, this is uh, this is what they said. They never ate of it, and they've never tasted it because they want to make sure that nobody would accuse them of giving them a lesser, you know, bread and them eating the good bread. So uh, I find that really good. I like integrity and honor, and we it, that's something we need to uh, incorporate. And integrity just means doing what's right when nobody is looking, nobody's watching you, nobody. Well, we all know that Yah sees everything, right? But you know what I'm saying? There's nobody else around, but you do what's right, and you do that out of your heart of kindness, then Yah loves that. He loves that. That's maturity, and that's what this whole 100-year life is. It's all about maturity, walking up the steps of maturity of to righteousness, holiness, walking completely in the fruits of the Spirit, no flesh, cutting out all the fleshly desires and flesh everything, completely Spirit-led. And this is what Yah is looking for for this 100-year step, step by step, is that's how we make it, okay? So uh, verse 7 says frankincense, um, they would put frankincense on the bread. Um, and, frankincense, and the priest would eat this, right? So um, it's uh, what they found is frankincense is very healing. It has been proven to help uh, fight cancer. Also, it uh, has the highest vibration on anything on earth. And um, everything has a frequency. Um, a lot of people trip out about this, but <laughs> it's true. Everything has a frequency. They measure it, okay? I mean, everything puts off energy. The average person's frequency is 51 megahertz. Cancer patients are said to have 27 megahertz. Um, frankincense has a very high frequency of 147. So when they're eating this fre frequency of 147, they're offsetting uh, if they have a low frequency. Some people say because when you eat meat, it has a zero frequency, and that really brings your uh, frequency down. And uh, this is all theory, right? I'm just throwing this out here as a theory. Uh, but I find it uh, very intriguing. Um I don't know how true it is, but I just find it, I find it really, uh, t t why were the priests uh, eating frankincense of all things, you know, on their bread? But uh, so this is, this is uh, what some have concluded to uh, theorize on, and I find it very uh, fascinating. Um, it needs more study, but I think it's, I think it's really cool. But okay, so the theory is that you consume frankincense or baswellia is, is, um, 
also a, a super great anti-inflammatory. It, it, it's actually frankincense in the pill form, and I study this as a master herbalist. It's, uh, it has a high, it's very healing, and it works like turmeric is anti-inflammatory. It lowers inflammation in your body. So this has been proven through scientific research, um, and we all know that inflammation causes all, most all diseases come from inflammation. So uh, let's see, inflammation um, causes cancer. Inflammation is tied to diabetes. Uh, it's caused, it's, it's the root of heart disease and, uh, um, cl and clogged arteries. And, um, you know, all the, all, Alzheimer's is inflammation of the brain. So, I mean, all these things uh, have to do with inflammation. These are the four biggest killers and they're tied in with inflammation. So if you're taking Basuele, it's going to lower your inflammation but the theory also is it lowers your, um, it hires your frequency, and you want a higher frequency in order to be healthier, according to this theory. Bad thoughts can lower your frequency 10 to 15 megahertz, uh, they've proven, and um, good thoughts can raise your uh, um, frequency by 10 megahertz. So this is important for cancer patients. It's funny that when cancer patients watch comedies, they watch comedies every night. All of a sudden, their mood is lifted and uh, they're healed. So this is an uh, interesting tie in there. Okay, eating processed food, meat, dairy can lower your frequency quite a bit. Uh, because the priests eat so much meat, uh, I believe y'all had them eat fr frankincense to lower their... Uh, to. The counter of the lower of the frequency uh, because they're eating low frequency foods. Uh, some people have said that low frequency can cause cancer and high frequency can cure cancer. Uh, a lot of, I know of somebody who was healed from cancer with using essential oils in a healthy diet. So, um, you know, eating processed food, meat, dairy is, uh, is between 0 and 3 megahertz, so extremely low. So essential oil... Uh, free, uh, Frequencence has the highest frequency known to man. And that's pretty good. Now, um, as far as something that's consumable. Linen has a high frequency of 5,000. The priest would wear uh, linen tunics. And uh, the high priest would wear wool and linen separately. Two, two separate fabrics. And, um, and wool has a frequency of 6,000. So... And uh, Dr. Yellen tested linen, and he stated that it has a frequency of 5,000. And he says that because of this high frequency, it has healing properties. And there are testimonies of people who have worn linen and slept in linen sheets who have healed more quickly. Um, organic non-dyed cotton has a 100 uh, frequency, which is pretty high. And uh, a lot of people wear cotton. And uh, non-organic cotton has a frequency of 40, which is kind of low. So, so this is uh, the, the the priests were wearing high-frequency clothes and eating high-frequency frankincense. Uh, I find it very interesting. We don't really know all the uh, ins and outs uh, of frequency, but we just learned about vitamins a uh, hundred years ago. I think it was 1912. Uh, yeah, 1912, we, f we finally figured out what vitamins uh, benefit us. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's something to this, I think. Uh, it's something to be studied out. Um, verse 8. In verse 8, they cooked the showbread on Friday night, and they would bring it to... Um, I believe they would cook the, the bread on Friday night before sundown, and the showbread, and they would deliver it on Saturday, Friday night before sundown. And so <clears throat> they would deliver it uh, on Saturday. Okay. The Egyptian was married to an Israelite. is proof that pagans come out of Egypt with Israel and were grafted in. And this is Leviticus 24.10. Showing an Egyptian married to a Israelite. So this proves that people can be grafted in. Okay, verse 20, an eye for an eye. 
Okay, this is interesting because uh, an eye for an eye does not mean, this is uh, my opinion on this, um, an eye for an eye does not mean that one, when one who poked out the eye of another has his eye poked out, it means that that person pays damages to the other person for what he did to him of equal value. So he didn't go out and poke out the other eye. Um, so Yah is setting up a rule of justice and measure for measure. And so he's trying to get people to understand that when you do something bad, you need to pay for it. And it's a good, it's a good system. Um, but I don't think it was the same, but it would be the same compensation. I think that's what they're looking for here. And Yah is an almighty of justice. And, and when you are dealing with fleshly people, you have to have a system of justice. And this is why Yah is setting up here. However, the man who walks in the spirit reacts differently to a bad situation, such as um, a bull killing another bull. The man in the flesh would demand that the bull be reimbursed fully under the law, and it would be right under the law, right? Because it's commanded right here in Scripture. However, the man who lives in the Spirit, and walking in all the fruits of the Spirit, would not ask to have his bull restored with money or equal vacuum, but forgives that person and trusts that Yah will restore his income and his bull. And this is a man walking in the spirit. And this is what we need to learn. That Yah is abundant. He's, he's an almighty of abundance. He can make a tree grow out of nowhere. Right? He can get you a bull. And this reminds me of a story of um, a friend of mine who um, he had one car. And he noticed his friend lost his job. Um, oh, his car broke down. Then he lost his job because he didn't have a car. And he was all bummed out. And so he gave him his car. He only had one car, him and his wife. And he gave, he prayed about it. And he said, the Almighty wants me to give you this car. And so he gave him his only car. And so here he is taking the bus to work. And his wife has to walk to the grocery store and stuff. And uh, this guy gets his job back and gets back on his feet. He's not depressed anymore. And he's just like, you know, it's a big testimony uh, with Yah. And then guess what happens? Uh, the guy gets another car given to him for free, not only three months later, in a bigger, better, bigger car because they have kids. So this is how Yah works. I mean, they had to go three months, but guess what? Yah provided. And this is living and walking in the Spirit. And this is what Yah wants in our lives. He wants us to be Spirit-led and not in the flesh and all about justice and all this, you know? Yah is looking for people who are wronged and forgive and don't ask for justice in return. This is exactly what Yahushua did on the cross. He forgave the people that were killing him and asked that Yah forgive them of this crime and not hold it against them. So that no justice was done to them. This is powerful. I mean... These people are beating him to death and killing him. And he's saying, don't hold this crime. They know not what they do. This is walking in the spirit of the law. This is the spirit, right? This is what we need to grasp onto. We don't want the law of justice, right? Every time. we we Yah is, vengeance is mine, says Yah. So Yah will take care of you. You just need to trust and have faith. So this is walking in the spirit and the law. And it's one of the highest forms of love. This is love, man. This is the ultimate love. This is being perfected. Once you get to this level, you're already in the kingdom. Right? The fleshly person would want justice, an eye for an eye, which is legally correct, but not spiritually correct, I don't believe. We are to become spiritually mature. Remember, Yah sees everything and will correct all wrongs himself. We need to build more faith by doing this, walking in the Spirit and forgiving others and trusting in Yah and not make a big deal about somebody who owes you some money. So forgiving a debt is, is like forgiving a person, and especially if they're poor. Then it would be even it would be a, a great honor of an, and it would show great integrity. So it's something to work on. Remember, this life is just a test and all things uh, will be restored in the kingdom. So it is better to suffer now than to ruin your reward in the eternal life and ruin your chance for being part of the royal family. 
right? We got to keep our eyes on the the kingdom. Always keep our eyes on the kingdom. People are not to have. Uh... So the sacrifices. I'm <laughs> just changing the subject here. The sacrifices are not to have blemishes, and and the priests, the people, were not to have blemishes. Priests are not allowed to marry a divorced woman. Okay, so I'm just going through the last part here. Oh, here's the last part I was just going to end this with. The Israelites travel for two years. A lot of people don't know, don't know this, right? Uh, but the Levites uh, or the Israelites only traveled for two years in the desert. And um, the rest of the time they spent 38 years at Kadesh Barnea. 38 years they spent there. And um, they only traveled to, uh, they, they only traveled for two, two years. They spent one year in uh, Mount Sinai. So actually they only traveled about one year total within that 40 years. Because you've got two million people, you know, you don't want to be traveling. I mean, that's, that's just a lot of work. But they did travel a lot right when they came out. And towards the end they were heading to um, um to the to the Jordan River in near uh, um, Jericho, so um, you know w when you read the scriptures and it seems like they were always traveling, but in reality they spent thirty eight years in Kadesh Barnea. So I just wanted to let people know that so you can understand and see a, in, a, in a bigger light. So I found that really interesting as well. Okay, well, I just want to thank you so much for listening. I hope this was beneficial. And uh, uh, if you know anybody who's a Sunday keeper, and uh, and uh, ask them to come with you to Sabbath with you. Uh, Sabbath, Exodus 31 says it's forever. Um, Genesis 2, he blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Anything he blesses and made holy, we cannot defile. That's in Leviticus. And uh, I think we just read it, actually, at the beginning of this chapter, yeah. Um, and so uh, Hebrews 4.9 is a New Testament command to uh, keep the Sabbath. So I just pray that uh, Yah help us to be clean at all times. Help us to be forgiving like the Messiah. Help us to not get mad, but only keep our eyes on the kingdom, Father. Help us to to be guided towards you and your ways help us to walk up that ladder of maturity so that we can be perfect and righteous before your eyes father as you are kodesh 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 father you are love you are light you are beautiful you are perfect may i all glory be given to you father may yah bless you and keep you may he shine his face upon you and be gracious to you may he pour out his countenance and give you shalom